Hi, Hi everybody. everybody. Thank you. Good. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. It's my first, my inaugural uh, stint with you guys. And uh, so far, so good. It's beautiful. It's wonderful speakers. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be among them. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to give a, um, a slide talk. Um, hopefully, it'll be reasonably entertaining. Um, and then maybe we'll get to questions I prefer at the end. Um, but I want to... Um, to really give the big picture on drinking water as I discovered it as not an engineer, not as a biochemist or a toxicologist, um, but where I began my journey into environmental health, which I didn't even know what that was, even as a practicing physician, um, about nine or 10 years ago. And it really launched me into this world um, and really wondering how I never knew about any of this. And then if I didn't know anything about many of these topics, certainly my colleagues did not as well. So I'm going to launch right in, forgive the glasses, but I am old. So let me go to screen share. Okay. And then I think I do play from start. Okay, great. So um, let me move this up here. Um, so I want to talk about, oops, I don't know if I can go forward. Here we go. I want to talk about clean drinking water, which has really emerged for me as the big topic. I mean, I, I am covering cosmetics, personal care products, cleaning products. Um, we just did a big monograph, my co-author and I, Dr. Fred Bomsal, um, air pollution and its risk to human health. But out of all of the topics that I have now um, sort of delved into over the last um, nine years with two books, this one has really become the emerging issue for me. And the reason I, I say that to begin with is because of just the amount of drinking water that we all need to consume. But on a, in addition to that, just how little we all know about the topic. So this, this disconnect is so shocking to me. Um, and of course I was part of it before I knew anything, but in general, I think this is a really important topic um, that we all need to understand and, and understand the options because I'm all about the options and the solutions. So let's get started, let's see. Ah, so this was actually my slide in this talk um, a few years ago, and it couldn't be more um, important even now, now that we have um, been living in a worldwide pandemic, um, these hazmat suits could not be more um, frightening and yet uh, so apropos. Um, I talked about and made the audience laugh with chemicals that we're now exposed to, but now, of course, we can extend that to viruses um, and, and potentially more to come. Um, so it was meant to make a chuckle, but I, I've left it in because it really is almost more pertinent now than it even was a few years ago, um, but not to scare people away from solutions. Again, I think that's really kind of critical to not just present harmful or harm, information about harmful chemical exposures and radiation, some other topics, but to always preface by saying there will be solutions at the end of the talk or end of the discussion. So the first question I ask everybody, including my patients, about any topic really is, well, why should we care? I mean, why should it take up any space in our brain? Um, why should we um, you know, really think about this being an issue if it doesn't really bother us? I mean, chemicals in general, most chemicals, you know, really don't smack you in the face, right? They don't necessarily give you a rash. Um, certainly the thousands and thousands that we're exposed to, um, you know, at this rate, we're at about 95,000 in the United States per, you could estimate more, but 95,000 chemicals that are now available um, in the uh, consumer market to, in all our products in the United States. Each year now, uh, just to give some statistics, um, there are over a thousand new chemicals that are put into use. At least 15 new polymers are patented um, in the United States every week. Um, there are over a thousand likely endocrine disrupting chemicals that currently exist, which we'll talk about what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, and only five chemicals have ever been banned in the United States under the Toxic Substance Control Act, which was passed in 1976, which was under the Ford administration. Um, so you can see that we have a very difficult time in this country um, writing or executing any legislation that protects consumers from environmental chemicals that we now know are harmful. And um, in fact, Europe does a much better job. They have much more stringent 
um, and rigorous um, oversight. Uh, they have upwards of 1,200 chemicals that have been removed from their markets when, when the evidence shows that there's harm. Um, on, in this country, unfortunately, um, we are stuck in a situation where the consumer is the last to know and manufacturing is biased. Um, and we are biased towards manufacturing in terms of laws and regulations. Um, and in fact, we are not privy to any information regarding ingredients in the products we use in our, uh, as cosmetics, personal care products, um, feminine care products. Um, so it is quite a problem. Now, I also like to discuss very briefly the concept of anthropology and how that plays into not only all of my medical work and all of my research, because I think if we don't bring in the conversation of anthropology and evolution, um, and understanding how we got into this pickle, we're missing a very big piece of the puzzle. Um, we have been evolving. Uh, Earth is over 4.6 billion years old. Um, we as human beings have been evolving more or less 4.5 million years. You could argue 250,000 for our latest, you know, for Homo sapiens, but a really long time. And we have had all of these 95 plus thousand uh, industrial chemicals um, in our lives for just about 100 years, maybe 150, you could argue, but really about 100 years. So as a clinician, as someone who's seeing more and more autoimmune diseases, I'm an autoimmune disease specialist as a rheumatologist, um, seeing more thyroid conditions, hyper, hypo, thyroiditis, um, thyroid cancers, cancers, um, certainly endocrine um, sensitive cancers like endometrial, uterine, um, prostate, um, thyroid. Um, you know, we're, we're starting to see more and more disease um, and the numbers will support this epidemiologically at younger and younger ages. But I began to feel this even over the last 20 years of practicing medicine that I'm seeing younger and younger um, patients with chronic illnesses, illnesses that you would expect to see you know, maybe later in life after maybe a lifetime of exposure, as well as acute issues such as, you know, food allergies, um, which, you know, is un unheard of now. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of that asthma, um, food allergies, so both acute and chronic illnesses, but I personally was affected by the fact that I saw this in my practice and I continue to see this in my practice. So from an anthropology perspective, we are just getting inundated with chemicals that have no required testing prior to going into the products that we use, sometimes using every day, multiple times a day over the course of a lifetime. Um, and our systems are getting, you know, um, irritated. They're getting irritated by these exposures. And in fact, not just individual chemicals have been shown to be problematic, which Again, there's many, but we, we can certainly find time to go into some of them. But when you have mixtures, mixtures of chemicals, in addition to medications, um, you can really start to see how it's not just one issue that could be a problem, but multiples that cause a synergistic effect, hormonally, immune system-wise, cancer risk, and so forth. 